Good evening. I am so excited to welcome you to this annual Oxford Community Arts Center Gala. I am Kim Paterka. I'm the board president and the co-chair of this event, along with Bonnie Mason. This is a very exciting moment to have, be in your homes with you because we haven't seen you in a very long time. And we want you to enjoy this evening. It is about you. Get excited for a fun ev evening. And I'd like to introduce you to our new executive director, Heidi Schiller. Hi, friends. It's so wonderful to be with you here this evening. What an amazing four months it's been for me here at the Oxford Community Arts Center. Everyone has been so welcoming, Kim and the board, the staff, all of our supporters and patron and audience. Kim, why don't you tell everyone how this evening is going to work? All right. So you will be bidding on GiveSmart, which you are already registered for, or else you wouldn't be seeing us tonight on this program. <laughs> you will see us on the right-hand side of your screen of your smart TV, your tablet, or your mobile device. And then along the left-hand side of the screen, you have your item bid button, and then you also have a donate button. You can access those items at any time. You can browse those items throughout the entire event. The lineup of events begin with Andrea Rodella and Tomas Garcia with a mini concert for you. We have a wine tasting by Bob Turner and Jack Keegan from Ohio Valley Wine. We have interviews with artists and highlights of the gallery hanging Art of Nature that are featured for this year's gala. And we have Bruce Murray doing a 20 minute segment specifically for our event. So you should be very excited to see that. Yeah, absolutely. We're also going to include some interviews with our artists from the Art and Nature exhibit, as well as interviews from some of our staff members. And we will also be talking about all of our lovely auction items and highlighting some of the key pieces that we think you should be excited about. So it's going to be a really wonderful evening, and we're happy that you've joined us tonight. New this year, and something really fun, is a mystery box, and we're doing this in the way of a raffle. Your chances are one for $10, or you can buy three chances for $25. The items in these boxes have been curated by our gala committee, and they range in value from $35 to $135. When we pull the raffle numbers at the end of the night at 10 p.m., we will either contact you by phone, text, or email. Kim, why don't you tell us about some great items that are on the table tonight? All right, so to start, we have this beautiful antique bee brooch. It's 14 karat gold. It's approximately from the 1920s. It has 19 brilliant cut diamonds set in platinum with a locking C-class. It is a lovely treasure and a, a really beautiful theme of nature to wear on your shoulder and enjoy an evening out. This sculpture is by local artist Mike Wright, and it is a sarcopia moth. It rests on a natural wood base with stones, and it's a polymer resin clay. It's a perfect gift for the naturalist in your life. So the next item that we're very excited to tell you about is a gorgeous little sculpture by Ursula Roma. She's a local artist. This is Circle Birds, and it is 16-gauge steel and powder-coated with a black powder coat. And I actually have some of her work in my house. And this one is very whimsical and fun and good for the ornithologist in your life. You can hang it on the wall. You could have it rotating in your living room, or you can use it in a window as window art. So it's Circle Birds by Ursula Roma. It is a very, very fun object. The next item I'd like to tell you about is a high tea for eight with local caterer Karen Schwartz. She is well known in the Oxford community, and this is a very fun event. You can enjoy this with girlfriends. You can do it for a wedding shower. You can do it for a birthday. It is a good way to celebrate any occasion or just have a fun Sunday. I have been in Karen Schwartz's house, and this tea, you can either have it in your own home, or if you feel more comfortable, you can have it at Karen's house. And she does a lovely job. She's a fabulous cook. She's a great hostess. It's a beautiful location. She lives right in Fairfield, so it's not very far from Oxford. This one is one I'm bidding on. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the piece of work here in front of me. This is the artwork that we chose to be the image for this year's gala. Every year we do a call for artists and select one featured artwork. And this is what we use as the inspiration for the print work, the colors of the table settings, the theme of the overall gala. And we were very excited about this one because it is in Monet's Garden by Marsha Waller. She was inspired by a trip to Monet's Garden with her granddaughter on a Rhodes Scholar trip. 
And this is lovely, 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 bright and summery and something that just evoked the feeling that we wanted to get across for this year's gala. So this item is a very, very fun and exciting uh, gift for either yourself if you're not a gardener and you just want to enjoy planters at your house and don't have the, the time or the inclination to put them together. The Serene Miller will come to your home with two containers of your choice up to 16 inches and she will plant them at your house. So she will play off the colors of your environment and you can pick your season, spring, summer, fall or even winter and you can do this in your home or if you have a local business and you need to spruce it up. This is a lovely, lovely item for yourself or as a gift to give to somebody else. You know, Kim, this is a great gift for someone like me who's a sometimes gardener. It's colorful, it's personal. If you are not a perfect gardener, these are perfect for your house. Tonight is about supporting the OCAC. Tonight is about having fun and enjoying some great music, drinking some fabulous wine with our very good friends, Jack and Robo. We're ready to renew your spirit energize your mind and bring inspiration to you through art, through music, and through all the wonderful things we do here at the Oxford Community Arts Center. The Arts Center is a great place for everyone in the community to get together and share their art with other people. You can walk into the building and I may never have met you before and we can start talking about the art exhibitions here or the music that we do here and there becomes this rapport between the two of us and it just it, it creates instant connections with people. There is so much energy in this building. It's alive with the spirit of the people who've been in this building since 1849. All of that energy is imbued in this building. I love how the Oxford Community Arts Center is a place to do art in your community. If it's your art and you want to share it with people and you want to go out and find people who you want to teach, this is a place that you can do it. There absolutely is something here for every person who walks into this building. So if we can find a way to bring people into the Art Center, whether it's through our Howl at the Moon program or a Chocolate Meltdown or a Second Fridays or doing an art exhibition, then the conversation becomes, you're an artist too. I never knew I could do anything like that. You're an artist too. Thomas Garcia is an associate professor of ethnomusicology and Latin American studies at Miami University. He holds a doctorate in historical performance practice from Duke University, a master's in musicology from the University of Massachusetts, and performance degrees from the Juilliard School. Specializing in Brazilian music, he has performed throughout the United States, Europe, and Brazil in diverse cultural institutions, including Alice Tully Hall and Merkham Concert Hall in New York, the Villa Lobos Museum, and the Museum of the Republic of Rio de Janeiro. Andrea Rodella is a professor of oboe at Miami University and a graduate of the Juilliard School and the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Andrea was a soloist at the Monteverde Oboe Festival in Bolzano, Italy, and with the Camerata Rio Chamber Orchestra in Rio de Janeiro and the Pacific Symphony in Vladivostok, Russia, as a representative of the U.S. Department of State. She is an F. Loray Paris performing artist.
Welcome back, everyone. Wasn't that a fabulous musical piece by Thomas and Andrea? That Brazilian music just really gets you pumped up and excited for this evening's event. With me, I have now Jeff McDonald. Jeff, wasn't that a great musical piece? Loved it. Loved it. Loved I've it. I've heard it before, and they get better every time. Oh, that's fabulous. It's good. good. So Jeff and I are going to talk just a little bit about some of our special auction items. And the first section we're going to talk about are some dinner packages. I'm new to Oxford, so I'm going to let Jeff tell you about where the great places to eat are in Oxford. Jeff, what we got? We have three great offerings. Uh, really just down the street from uh, the Oxford Community Arts Center. The first is uh, Crew Gastro Lounge, run by Mike Patterson. And he's offering a meal uh, for six, and he is serving up three bottles of wine at his selection. I've been there many a times in the past. Go, I'm sure you will enjoy it. You got to get there too. <laughs> the next offering is Patterson's Cafe. This is run by Michelle Patterson. She's offering a brunch for six and unlimited supply of mimosas and Bloody Marys. So go have a ball and enjoy the offerings at Patterson's Cafe. The third offering is Paisano's Pasta House. Mike and Pat Lanny run uh, the pasta house, have for years, great Italian offerings. And the offer here is for a group of six, along with appetizers and uh, dessert. And once again, Mike and Pat will select the wine to fit the meals that you have selected off the menu. So bid up and enjoy, and you'll have a good time. My name is Howard Krauss and I do acrylics and I also draw with pencil and charcoal. However, primarily I work with watercolors. I actually started in art very early, probably five or six years old. I'm from Brooklyn, New York City, and I live two blocks from the Brooklyn Museum of Art for 15 or so years. I would go to the art museum on a Saturday morning and there was a lady who would teach the children in the street who ha how about art. We would go to a gallery, look at a picture, she'd tell us about that and the artist, and then we would go downstairs and paint. And from that, I learned the rudiments of painting. It is not what I do because I learned very, also very early the term starving artist. Not being, wanting to be one, I pursued something else. I'm a research chemist. Having grown up in Brooklyn, I was not enamored with the concrete jungle. i much rather be hugging a tree. Most of my art are places that my wife and I have been, or my family have traveled to. I spent most of my summers in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York and was free to roam around, fish, and also paint, even as a child, that is. Then I spent five years in, five summers, in Acadia National Park. And having nothing to do, not knowing anybody up there, I also painted the shapes and nuances of nature are what trigger my interest in a particular scene. However, if you look at many of my art, you will also see buildings in them. I learned also very early that you can't paint everything. And because of that, I had to learn how to eliminate 70 to 80% of what I see to make a painting. When a person who is a non-artist looks at a painting or a picture, their eye travels all around the edges. They convince themselves 
that this is a tree or a bunch of trees, and then they spend the rest of their life counting every single leaf and needle that's on these trees. And to paint that would take a lifetime to paint one picture. So you make a representation, and that's what I do. Hi, I'm Tracy Bozeski. I live in the Oxford area and I like to paint plain air, uh, going out onto the scene and painting the scene on site. And I feel that gives me, uh, I can capture the essence of an experience because you only have a limited amount of time to work with and you see the colors that are there and the light that is there. It doesn't stay in the same place very long, but uh, that's the ch part of the challenge. It makes you paint fast, and that and that usually, it you know, it, it puts the pressure on you, makes you do your best. I think the more that you touch it, the you lose the more of the color and the energy that was there when you first applied it. I bring a portable easel that I can set up. It has a, tr a tripod and uh, I can set my paint on it. Things happen when you're outdoors. Uh, I mean, one time I was, it was at the Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, homestead and there was a horse, a very young one, and it, it would run around and then sleep and every time it would creep a little closer to me until it was just sitting right next to me. Some of the ones that would have been done on site would be, this was uh, Houston Woods. This was over at, in Brookville Lake. Uh, this is one of those old cemeteries up there. This is a studio painting. Um, it's Cypress in fall colors and it was done at Spring Grove. I grew up in the plains, and so I, uh, I like skies, and a lot of my pictures have skies in them, and I like sunsets also. Since I've been out here, I've been learning more about trees and really fascinated by, like the sycamore and the cypress, I haven't seen much of those before. It really is one of the things that makes me most happy uh, and it gives me a, a sense of purpose, accomplishment, and I like working with other artists, meeting other artists. It's a really good experience. My name is Lee Baker DeVore. I can't tell you how long I've been doing art because I've been doing it as long as I remember. As far as art and nature goes, for me, they're very interconnected because I also can't remember a time when I wasn't immersed in nature. And sometimes the artwork is conceptual. This piece is a, is a conceptual diary, if you will, of the seasons in my life. Other work is how I feel about a place. 
The North Country has a quality of light, especially in the fall. The whole idea of this painting was to capture that, almost the smell of the sunlight and the grass and the crystalline air. It was done from sketches and memories and reference photos. Uh, when people say, you know, what's art, you know, they're always thinking of the product. And I'm thinking of your point of view. How do you connect to what you're doing? I brought this piece because it's an example of my found mediums. This one is made with mud and grass rubbed into the surface and ashes and a charred stick. So I found different colors of earth and mixed them with a matte medium to get them to bind to the surface. And then it's just finger painting. I particularly like working like this because I can't get real fussy. So it's a lot more intuitive, it's more gestural. It's not just painted, it's tied to the earth, it's tied to the site where I did this. This last piece is a commission. And uh, the challenge with a commission is to produce a piece that you feel is authentic, not just commercialized. It's very fortunate in this that the client said, I want a painting of Sonoma County where I live in California. So it was, a, I got lots of reference material from her. I did some research on my own. I came up with sketches and a little paint study and stuff. And, and uh, they chose the composition that they liked out of what I produced. Um, so I, felt like I could really connect to this scene by the time I finally got around to painting the big one. As far as influences, um, I was majorly influenced by the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. Berthe Morissot, who was one of the few women Impressionists and Post-Impressionists to be shown in the salon, and her brush strokes are just so inspiring to me. Welcome back everyone to our beautiful sunlit evening here at the Oxford Community Art Center. This is a beautiful kinetic sculpture for your yard. Jeff, can you tell us a little more about it? Absolutely, Heidi. This sculpture is made by Bill and Jean McGaw up in Boston, Indiana. Their business is called McGaw's of Boston and they've been making metal sculptures like these for a lot of years. You'll see a lot of them in and around the Oxford area. They're handmade, they're heavy duty. They call this music in the wind. We've got another great one of a kind art piece for you right now. Jeff, show the guys what we got. You bet, Heidi. What we have here is a really clever birdhouse. It's built by Mike Smith, our current mayor of Oxford. And in his bird houses, he uses random things in order to decorate and be functional. It makes a wonderful home. It's well built. Just hang it up in a tree nearby and enjoy. Where's Heidi? I'm not sure we're in the middle of an auction here. And uh oh, here comes Heidi. And here's our next auction item. Wow, you okay? <laughs> Gee whiz. What we have here is a wonderful bike donated by Oxford's BikeWise store. And uh, it's colorful. It's got a removable basket in here so that she can go Krogering. And it's very simple. 
and uh, there's no maintenance, as I've been told, and it's all just going to put a smile on your on your face. And let me tell you, this is so much fun to ride. <laughs> I'm bitten first, so you guys got to beat me to it. And now that you've got your bike, and let's take you to a couple of places where bikes are used only. Jeff, can you tell the folks about one of our getaway packages? Well, the first one is we're going to Mackinac Island up in northern Michigan. And on Mackinac Island, as most of you know, you don't use anything but bikes on the island. And the offering is a two-night stay at the Clog Hun uh, Bed and Breakfast. It's a grand old house built in 1884, just been restored. The ambiance is unbelievable, full of antiques, and plus you're on the island and there's the lakes. How can you go wrong? Wow, that sounds like a great package. That's item number 213. What's our other bed and breakfast getaway? Well, we're going to Granville, Ohio. That's the home of Denison University. And we're going to the Welsh Hills Inn. It's a very, very quaint little place, and you're going to have a night in the uh, executive suite, along with uh, snacks the night before and a superb breakfast the next day, and then the opportunity to enjoy the town of Granville. It's quaint, uh, lots of little shops. And it's a university town, which always has a nice ambiance. Really, this is a great package you could do for a one night stay. Uh, invite your friends and have a great time. While you're traveling to your getaway locations, why not take this beautiful illustrated book by Oxford native Bonnie Allen. This beautiful book is glossy printed and it would be great for the kids to read in the back seat. It's so appropriate for young people today and in the world that we're living in now. It involves inclusion, it involves uh, generosity, it involves understanding, it involves all those things that all of us have been looking for during, during these most difficult times. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have a young person in your life, please bid on this particular item by Oxford native Bonnie Allen. And now we have a couple of items that can take place while you're enjoying your night away. The first one is three hours of labor from Mike Beale. And Mike Beale is an individual I've known for a long time and he's done marvelous work from building to staining a deck to fixing a cabinet in your home to rearranging your garage. Mike Beal is terrific. What he says is, I'm here to do all those things that you never have time to do. <laughs> the next offering we have here is Gardens by Kathy, run by Kathy Baxter. And Kathy is offering you three hours to send her whole crew to your home to do whatever you need to be done in your yard. And that involves cleaning, reorganizing, planting, taking out, making your landscape around your home look a lot better. Kathy runs a tight ship. She's got a great crew. She's got good products. The last thing we have in here is car detailing. Hey. And I don't believe I've ever washed my truck. <laughs> and so Kevin Kepler is the guy who does this. So you've got a vehicle in your garage or in your drive or on the curb. Call him up and set it up. He'll do you a wonderful job. Our next segment is a virtual wine tasting with your friend and ours, Jack Keegan and Bob Turner from Ohio Valley Wine. Good evening and welcome to the Oxford Community Arts Center Gala. Uh, my name is Jack Keegan. I teach the wines class at the university and my compatriot here. Bob Turner. I've been with Ohio Valley Wine for uh, 27 years up here in Oxford uh, and had many opportunities to taste wine with Mr. Keegan here. Uh, many times in his dining room uh, and on his deck and various other places we have definitely tasted well over 100, 100 times at least. So we've got three wines to choose from tonight for you to have on the tasting. And 
We'll start out with the Prosecco. Very often it's really nice to have a sparkling wine as an aperitif. Most people really like to have wine as an aperitif and so it really ends up being nice because it's light and typically not very high in alcohol. Though I, I always say there's that old song, you go to my head and linger like the haunting refrain, like the kicker from a glass of champagne. It is true because typically when you do sparkling wines, you don't have had food. And also the carbon dioxide in the wine will actually move the alcohol into your bloodstream a bit faster. And so you have to be careful uh, when it comes to those kinds of things. The wine we're doing today, as you can see in the front, is Di Faveri Prosecco. And one of the things that I wanted to do first was in fact show you how to open a bottle of sparkling wine properly. Obviously people really enjoy the pop of champagne, but you have to realize you're really dealing with a bomb here. You're dealing with pressure, typically between five and six atmospheres, and so there's sort of a right way and a wrong way to do this. I know the pop can be fun, but it can also be dangerous. Typically, and of course we'll see how I do on this, typically you have to get in there. Aha! It worked. And so take the top off. Uh, the person who taught the wines class before I did here at Miami always said that the bottle looked naked if you took off the entire capsule. And so we only typically just take off the top part, as you can see right there. Thanks, Bob. And so what you see then is that there is always a, a flange, I guess you would call it, or the wire that comes down. And there is always six turns on this wire. So what I do is I'm left-handed, and so I put my non-dominant hand, my right hand, on, the th on my thumb on there so that I can turn it six times and have it under control. And so it's opened up now, and now you can see that in fact it's loosened from the bottom. And then what I do is I hold the cork, hold the bottle, or actually turn the bottle and hold the cork. So as I turn, you can see if you look closely that the cork has already started to raise. And of course, the most important thing is keeping it under complete control. And there you have a properly open bottle of sparkling wine. Very well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I should have poured for you first. As you can see, I put these in flutes. Uh, of course, many people now feel that especially with good sparkling wine, you can put it into a white wine glass. But the flutes are so nice. These, in fact, were given to me by a friend because, again, you can see the bubbles so nicely. And I always say it looks like an upside down blizzard. So it really is sort of fun to watch the bubbles rise in the uh, glass. So it really is very nice that way. Uh, the wine is Di Faveri. And again, it's Italian. And so um, the wine actually comes, it's Prosecco. Uh, and it's Prosecco Superiore because it actually comes there two towns up in the hills near, above Treviso, Valdebiadne and Conigliano, and so they can call their wine superior. And so it's a much better quality. Now the other Proseccos you get will just be, you know, just be regular Prosecco and still very good. But at the same time, these are a step above in this. Okay? Cheers. Cheers. So I do know that in our many uh, Prosecco tastings over the years, this has always been your go-to Prosecco. Yes, and in fact, it's interesting. Um, Prosecco, of course, used to be the name of the grape, but this is, in fact, the grape is 100% glera. And in fact, I started looking around uh, f to see if anyone else has grown, and they do grow some of this grape in South America. But um, they started making Proseccos in South America. Well, the problem ends up being is, the Italians did not like that. So they went back and took the old name. And so they call the region Prosecco. So now, because of the way the laws are, you cannot use the word Prosecco unless it's from that area. This is actually done in a what's called a bulk, or if you're Italian, the Martinotti uh, method, meaning that they actually take this wine, they make a wine, and then they put it into a big stainless steel tank that's under pressure because they put yeast and sugar in here. And so the second fermentation is how you get the bubbles in the wine. And so they actually do this in a tank and then they pull it out of the tank under pressure. And so this is different than champagne where they actually make the wine in the bottle. This is made in a tank. So again, Cheers. let's taste this. Cheers. Yum. So nice.
All right, so now we're gonna move on to our white wine of the night, which is Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, but not the Kendall Jackson Chardonnay that you're thinking of. Uh, this Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, by the way, has been an unheard of number one selling Chardonnay in the United States for 27 straight years. But we wanted to put a little wrinkle in there, so we came up with, or we're gonna pour the Kendall Jackson Jackson Estate Chardonnay from Santa Maria Valley in Santa Barbara. Uh, completely different style, uh, single vineyard, and I think we'll find out very yummy, just like the Kendall Jackson. It's interesting. First thing, of course, you may notice about this wine is the beautiful golden color, because in fact, this has seen some oak and an amazing aroma. In fact, you don't have to take it to your nose. I can already smell this wine. And so that's what makes it really, really interesting also. Chardonnay itself is an interesting grape. It is, if you drink any white burgundies, a Mont Rocher, a Merceau, a Macon, a Puy Fuisse, they are all made from Chardonnay. And that's in fact where Chardonnay first came from, in fact, was the Burgundy region. And so a hundred years ago, that's probably about the only place that you could really get Chardonnay was there. But obviously it has become a world traveler. You can now, of course, get Chardonnays from California, from all over the world. Um, typically, uh, as with this one, as you can even smell, typically they're oaked. Uh, even though in Chablis and other parts of Burgundy, they will not put any oak in there. And in fact, it was so common for them to oak Chardonnays that about 10 years ago, they started coming out with unoaked Chardonnays and they had to actually put that on the label because in fact, it was so common uh, to have an oak in the Chardonnay. So again, you see this beautiful golden color that is there. One of the reasons that I swirl the wine is because it puts more of the aromas of the wine into the air so I can smell it better. But this really just has an amazing aroma. I mean, I just cannot get over how much, you know, how much I can smell it even when it's not even close to my nose. And it only spent seven months in oak, correct? Yes, that's yeah. right, seven months in oak. Uh, yeah, so really uh, just a beautiful, it's got really sort of nice sort of lemon, I think a sort of a baked pear. I get like buttered biscuits. Oh yeah, because there certainly is a butter part to that, which is very common from the oak, that you will get those butter overtones in this wine. And it is lovely without without being too much. I'm not a big fan of an over oak wine. And again, if you taste this wine. What's wonderful, several things are wonderful about this wine. First of all, it's the creaminess. It has just such a wonderful creamy texture that just, you know, that makes it just so inviting. The other thing, of course, is it has nice acidity and it's not over oaked. It is really the flavors of the, of the fruit that really comes through. I would say pears and apples and just has a nice grip to it. Mango and pineapple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because very often some down there in the south. Uh, this is from the Santa Maria Valley. Now you may not be so familiar with that area, uh, but it is, it, it's very interesting because it's very close to the Santa Rita Hills, which has become a major area for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the geography. It's funny you say that because this is on the California coastline, but this is, this Santa Maria Valley falls in an east-west mountain range as opposed to the normal north-south. So how does that affect it? When you think about California, California has what is called a typical Mediterranean climate. But again, if you think about, you know, the south of France, they have cold, rainy winters, and then they have hot, dry summers. And, and they grow not the kind of grapes like Chardonnay that you'd think about. The reason California is different, and so many of these places are special, is because of the marine influence. What you have along the California coast is a cold ocean current. And that cold ocean current, and it's the ability to take that colder air in that allows you to grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, etc. I, I always like telling the class that Mark Twain famously said the coldest winter he ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. And that's because of that marine influence. And so with, as Bob said, that east-west, the, the cold air can funnel right up that valley. And so because of that, it is a lot cooler and so that really ends up being important. In fact, in the Santa Maria and you know that whole area, 
it gets warmer by one degree every mile. So close to the ocean, you go Chardonnay, you grow Pinot Noir, cool climate grapes. As you go further in, you grow Merlot, you grow Cabernet, you grow Syrah, because it gets warmer the further away you get to the ocean. So it's that marine influence that is so important in this. And the Santa Maria gets some of that, and so this is why you have just a really nice tropical um, Chardonnay that is not too heavy and just really beautiful fruit. You probably have never had this wine, I don't think. No, this is the first. That's yeah, what I thought. This is the first time I've ever had this wine. Well, it again, really is. with Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, again, it's unheard of to be the number one selling Chardonnay in and for 27 straight years in the United States. That's that's just an amazing feat. Uh, and this is actually something that, that we never really had a lot of until now. And it is such an upscale Chardonnay for them. Uh, it's just, you can tell it, it's so much more in depth uh, so much more complex. I mean, what you think you pair this with shrimp? Oh yes, you could choose shrimp. Uh, certainly lobster. Uh, certainly a cream sauce. Also because of you know just the sort of nice butteriness. I mean anything along those lines would just be so good. And one other thing I really want to say about Kendall Jackson is Jess Jackson, of course, had started the company, and that's actually his widow Barbara Banke, who has just been amazing in carrying on all of this. And the other thing that's great about Kendall Jackson that I really like is. They're environmentally concerned. It is really just great to see all the things that they have been doing that is very pro-environment, carbon neutral, all of those things. So Kendall Jackson is, is one of those really good companies and, also. And it is funny you say that because when he passed away, I'm gonna say it's six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. it was some concern. And I think his two daughters and Barbara Banke, they haven't lost a step in, in, in anything. I think every vintage for the last six years is just getting better each year, every varietal that they have. They're really doing a great job. Yes, beautiful. And if this is anything, this is a great wine. Very, very nice. Our third and final wine is our only red, which is Mount Veter Napa Valley Cabernet 2018. It is a just delicious wine that uh, most recently got a 95 from James Suckling and a 92 from Robert Parker, or I'm sorry, a 93 from Robert Parker, 92 from Decanter and a couple other places. And that speaks volumes. To me, it's still kind of young, but yet it's got plenty of time to, to grow too. Mm -hmm. yes. 2018 is a young Cabernet for, to get that kind of rating. Yes. Uh, by the way, of course, you know, and I tend not to be too doctrinaire, should we say, about glasses, but you did notice that we use three different glasses for these wines, obviously because we still have them, and because, again, it's really nice to have the flutes because you can taste or you can watch the bubbles, and so that's really nice. But as I said, you could use a white wine glass. Uh, this is actually a little bigger than a normal white wine glass, but also it holds the aromas very, very nicely too. Some other things, of course, these were actually these were a, a gift from an alum, uh, which was which was really great. These are in fact uh, very very nice red wine glasses. And one of the things that I always tell people when you when you get a glass is, of course, it's nice to have the stem because then the wine doesn't get warm. You hold it by the stem so that it doesn't get warm. You obviously don't get fingerprints on the on the glass and things like that. The other thing, of course, is you noticed that we swirl. And of course, the swirling increases the amount of aroma that you can get into the glass and into the wine, so you can simply smell it better. And of course, the thing is, is a lot of people don't realize you can tell so much about a wine simply by looking at it. Uh, for example, just to go back, I mean, the golden color on the Chardonnay is really a lot darker than you would see in most white wines, and that's because, of course, this has been oak aged, and so the oak imparts color also. And then as the wine ages, it becomes more and more golden. That's true for all whites. And reds typically start as this one does. And very often I like to put it against sort of a, a, a white background because it really has garnet highlights. And so that tells you it's young. As it gets older, it will stay very nice and cherry red, even older. What you start to see on the edge is almost a little bit of bricking. In other words, a little bit of orange on the edge. And so that tells you that that wine is aging as you're going along. And so you can really tell, and it still may be, in fact, perfectly drinkable and probably getting on some secondary characteristics and some nuance that it did not have early. Uh, this is probably, in fact, a great example because this wine being young, again, has all those wonderful purple highlights and will have great fruit. Uh, but 
as it ages, and trust me, this wine can age, you can certainly buy it and put it in your cellar or you know any place that's nice and cool and calm uh, for 10 years probably without any difficulty at all. So again, let's look at this wine, beautiful color. And if I throw it and smell it, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, this it's is the wonderful thing about wine. It really cherry. is. Oh, yeah, dark it's plum. cherry and plum. And it has a little bit of that. Um, again, it's sort of the funniest thing, again, in people when it comes to tasting wine, you find this all the time. It has a little bit of that pencil shavings. In other words, when you've just sharpened a pencil, it has some of that in there too. And that, you know, again, cassis, that black currant aroma. This just has so much going on. It Cedar. really is. Yes. Oh, just so many things. And just fresh and tremendous fruit. So again, I'm looking forward to tasting this one. Where do you consider Mount Veeder on the sub-appellations mm. of Napa Valley? You can talk for a little while longer. I still want to taste this wine. <laughs> it, is I mean, yummy. it is so delicious. And that's really what makes it so wonderful about this wine. And yet, at the same time, great fruit. But, and people always ask, it's like, oh, how, you know, how do you know that a wine ages? When you taste this wine, and I certainly hope you get a chance to, it's the grip and the finish. It's the good tannins that are there, but they're not, I mean, this wine is completely drinkable right now, but this wine will probably even shine more in five or seven years because it, it has that tannin, it has all of that fruit, and so it will sail into the next 10 years without any difficulty at all. Mount Veeder is really neat for several reasons. It is one of the sub-appellations, as we call them, in other words, the areas uh, in Napa Valley, and it is up on the mountains, Mount Veeder, sort of duh, uh, with that. But it's the closest also to Carneros. And that, of course, is the coolest part of Napa Valley because it's down in the south, closest to that cold marine influence that we talked about. And so that's really what makes it nice about that. So that it really holds and it really gives this wine, again, there's lots of fruit, but it's not, it's not overblown. It's not overly fruity. It really is balanced in its fruit and acid, etc., that makes it super. And Mount Veeder itself, it really is sort of very special. I mean, they only make a little over 1% of all the wine in Napa Valley. There are about 30 wineries up there. They go over 2,500 feet in elevation. Uh, and so really neat. And the other thing, of course, that's important is Napa is so different because you have, you have the floor which is very deep soils, very alluvial soils. And so they're very well drained and, and really typically make wonderful wines. That's where like the Tokolon Vineyard of Moldavi is or where it's where Ingolnok is with Nibon Coppola and all those other wonderful wineries. Up here, the soils are thinner. And in fact, typically they have to irrigate to keep the, to keep the grapes alive because it, in the summertime, there's nothing like in the bottom. So they will irrigate, but they use as little water as possible. So this is just, this is just beautiful. Mm. So, so nice, yes. And so it is, this wine of course can age uh, and, very, and very nice. Of course, Cabernet is king in Napa Valley. I mean, literally over 40% of all the grapes that are harvested in Napa are, are Cabernet. But tellingly, well over 55% of all the prices or what are sales in wine are Cabernet. And so this is, in fact, truly the one. And I want to say, uh, this wine, obviously a bit more expensive than, you know, sort of maybe an everyday wine, but the quality, I mean, shines through. And the quality for the price is through the roof. So as I taste this, knowing that the previous vintage was 82% Cabernet and then four or five other varietals thrown in, this one is actually 94% Cabernet, 3% Merlot, and 3% Malbec. Mm -hmm. So I remember years ago when I tasted a bl red blend with a supplier back in the day and it had like 1% Carignan in it. And my question was, can you really tell the 1% Carignan? And her response to me was, take it out and see what you get. Mm -hmm. It'll be completely different. Is that true? And if, if what do you get out of the, what 3% Merlot and 3% Malbec do you see in this? Very often, because Merlot tends to have a lot of really bright fruit, I think it really adds a little bit of that top note. It is amazing, and, and you're absolutely right, Bob, because 
I can remember the winemaker from, um, from Chateau Saint-Michel uh, doing a tasting a number of years ago. And in fact, some of these wines will have like 1% in. In many cases, it's really for the nose. You know, in other words, because again, Malbec has a lot of fruit to it. And, and Merlot is thin-skinned and has a lot more fruit also. And so it's the Cabernet that gives you the structure. I mean, it's the one with the tannins, it's one with the dark fruits, etc. So if you want to balance that out and brighten it up some, then you would add the Malbec, then you would add the Merlot. And so it really ends up being almost more in the nose than it is in the taste. Uh, I really think in those small amounts that are there. Yeah, just amazing. What, what makes mountain fruit, especially mountain fruit Cabernets, mountain valley Cabernets, so intriguing? I mean, honestly, every one I've ever had that's from a mountain side vineyard, they're just dynamic. And I just, is there something particular that makes them this way? Well, it's really interesting. And part of it has to do with that marine layer again, because what you have is a little warmer uh, up in the, it's, it's strange, it's warmer during the night and cooler during the day. And I think one of the things that happens with mountain fruit is you end up holding a little more acidity in the wine. And we never really think, I mean, obviously there's acid in this wine, but we never really think about it, but it's just amazing how a small difference in acid will change the flavor profile in a wine. I, I just, you know, one of the things I do in class is I will actually doctor and I will actually add a quarter teaspoon of tartaric acid to an entire bottle of wine. And it's like, this is a totally different wine. I mean, it's amazing how much acid makes a difference. And I think more than anything else, it's probably the acidity that you get up there in the mountains that are good. Not to mention, Mount Beter is on the Mayakama side of Napa, which means it gets the morning sun, which is cooler and so nicer. And so then it's the other side, the Vaca side, that gets the, the evening sun and it's warmer and drier. And so being up there, you know, it just, I think it just, it keeps the wines a little fresher just because of the acids sure, that are there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's beautiful though. It, this, this could go for 12 years. Oh yes, no problem at all. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So those are our three wines. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, you know, we talked about it and we just decided to do a red, a white and a sparkling. And you know, Chardonnay, it's the number one selling Barato in the world, so you have to pick that. And as far as red wine goes, Cabernet, it's by far the number one selling red wine in the world and the classiest. And then as far as the Prosecco goes, sparkling wine, it's very, very popular now. It's much less expensive than Champagne, but yet it's probably, what do you say, Prosecco is, is dominating Champagne in this market now, correct? Oh yes, well, percentage-wise, there's no question. It's because part of it is price. Of course, because you can't get a good champagne. Well, you can't even get a, a basic champagne for under $40. Uh, and so, and Prosecco's are. And especially with summertime, you know, it's re that's what's really nice too, is that we find more and more that, that sparkling wines in general are leaving that, oh, it's a special occasion, where now it's become the point, and maybe, of course, us being inside has to do with it. Oh, it's, it's Tuesday. I think I'll have a glass of sparkling wine. Uh, you know, I think that's a wonderful way to go, uh, without a doubt about that. Sure. Thank you very much, and I hope you support the wonderful work that happens here at the Oxford Community yes. Arts Center. Thank it is you for truly all you do. A great, great place, and hopefully, you're enjoying the event. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome back everyone and cheers. Thank you so much Jack and Robo for a great wine tasting. And again, if you'd like to pick up those wines, you can get them from Oxford Spirits or from Crew. Now I have with me our board member, Rosalind Benson. Welcome Rosalind to this evening's festivities. And Rosalind is gonna talk about the next great item you can bid on. Thank you, Heidi, and it's good to be here tonight. This is a pretty special item. It is from the Cincinnati Nature Center. I don't know if any of you have been to the Nature Center. Miles and miles of trails. You feel like you're in another world and you're just outside of Cincinnati. 
Our next items are two beautiful, one-of-a-kind jewelry pieces made by local artists. Rosalind, can you tell the people a little about them? I sure can. The first one is from Lucille Hata. Many of you know Lucille. She has been in Oxford for a long time. I have some of her pieces. These beautiful earrings that you want and need. When I was working at Miami, and my husband was working there also, Lucille Hata worked in the registrar's office and she would take the grades from faculty members. So she asked my husband, Bob, what are you gonna get Rosalind for Christmas? And he answered quickly, a bread machine. Lucille very wisely said, no, Bob. She has been looking at a piece of jewelry that I made. And that is how I got my first piece of Lucille Hata jewelry. You need one too. The other is a local artist that I'm not quite as familiar with. It's Karen Linder, and she has a really unique business where she takes antique jewelry and makes them into pieces that are one of a kind. You want to bid on this, and it also includes a gift certificate for a specially designed piece. Here at the Oxford Community Arts Center, we love our fine artists and our photographers. So this next piece is extremely special, and Roz is going to tell you a little bit more about it. Some of you may know Tom Hogeback, who has a studio and shop on College Avenue. This is not just one piece, it is a series of pieces. Wildlife is Tom's specialty, and he has really honed in on the individual qualities of each of these birds. Tom's work is very special. He really knows how to look at nature, and it's something that I think would enhance your life. So this is an absolutely special piece made by our own Alan DeCourcy, who is a current board member and a resident artist. Rosalind, can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Alan's piece is called October Orange. And if you know Alan's photographs, you know that he focuses in on the details and looks at things in a unique way. This would look beautiful almost anywhere. I would suggest that you bid on it and bid well. I am so excited about this next piece. It may be difficult to see from camera, but the texture and color of this piece are so vibrant, it's amazing. Terry Barrett is the artist who did this wonderful painting. A student of Crossan Curry, who many of you know, Crossan's distinct style is there as well as Terry's own touches. I think it would look great in Heidi's office, so someone bid on it for her. Our last auction item is this exquisite piece. Rosalind, can you tell us some more about it? This item is called Gray Fox. It is by John Ruffin. It is signed and numbered. You may know him. He is very famous for his wildlife images. I would urge you to bid on this. It's going to go fast. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move into our next musical section. We are very excited to present to you Bruce Murray. Bruce is an amazing pianist. You're going to sit back, relax, and enjoy. He is spectacular and my friend. Enjoy. Bruce Murray is a pianist, teacher, presenter, producer, and arts administrator. He holds a BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and a master's and doctorates from Yale. He was director of the School of Music at the University of Alabama, dean and artistic administrator of the Brevard Music Center in North Carolina, and for five years chair of the Department of Music at Miami University. Currently, he teaches in Miami's Department of Emerging Technology, where he's exploring ways that technology can enhance and expand the concert experience, whether in person or online. Murray has given nearly a thousand public performances in multiple settings, solo recitals, chamber music, and soloists with an orchestra. Since 2015, he has performed regularly at the Oxford Community Arts Center, primarily in a summer series of free recitals. Bruce Murray is a Steinway artist.
Hi, I'm Bruce Murray. I've been thinking about titles in classical music. Lots of classical pieces have titles, lots don't. The ones with titles seem to be more famous than the ones that are like Sonata, what was 31, number three. Um, titles can be good, they can be bad, they have their ups and downs. We have an American composer, John Adams, who does the best titles. The best titles. He wrote an opera called Nixon in China, of all things. And then he wrote one with an even better title, Dr. Atomic. Amazing. Look at the John Adams catalog, see the amazing, amazing titles that he comes up with time and time again. You know, my favorite John Adams title for a long time was a clarinet piece called Gnarly Buttons. Obviously, it has the word gnarly in it, which must be unique in uh, classical music. Um, curiously, this piece was commissioned, Gnarly Buttons, by a British clarinetist, it's a clarinet piece, uh, Michael Collins, probably the preeminent clarinet soloist in England, Mike. I call him Mike because a few years ago I got to play gnarly buttons with him on a chamber concert in Charlotte, North Carolina. Very cool. Um, John Adams wrote a piece for two pianos in 2016 that has his best title ever. It's called Roll Over Beethoven. Seriously. Uh, you can't copyright a title, which is why he could use those words. Yeah, Rollover Beethoven by John Adams seems to be, it's a good piece, I like it, maybe I'll get to play it sometime. I'm not sure it gets to the level of Chuck Berry though. If you go back in history, the composer with the greatest titles was Claude Debussy. And we're gonna hear pieces by Debussy now. The, the problem with titles in Debussy is he gave titles to everything. He wrote preludes and he gave them titles. That was new. Um, and the title is not that important. He said that repeatedly. Don't pay too much attention to the titles. In fact, in his preludes, he put the titles at the end of the pieces rather than at the beginning, which is kind of amazing. Um, but Debussy, I think, gets held back by the titles. The titles are so great and they're so pretty and poetic that it reinforces the word impressionist that is always attached to him and that is an unfortunate limiting and ultimately destructive term. Debussy was a phenomenal innovator and a great great composer. Look in the history of Europe he's a top 10 composer seriously top 10 no question if you want to rank them. He's a top 10, and he's not number 10 either. He's up there. He was really important. The stuff he invented, or some would say discovered in music, it became part of the mainstream. It was instantly accepted and ratified. And the great thing is, we can still listen to his music more than 100 years later. He died in 1918, and be blown away be amazed at the ingenuity, the brilliance, the power. Impressionism as a word doesn't do it for Debussy. Impressionism, impressionism is not a good word for music. So we're gonna hear Image, book two. Uh, three pieces, I will not desecrate the French language by trying to pronounce the titles in French, but in English, Bells Through the Leaves, here's a great one. And the moon descends on the temple that was. And finally, Goldfish. I can say that one, Poisson d'Or. Um, I'll put the French in the video, you'll see the titles. But this is truly great piano music by one of the great piano composers, Claude Debussy, Image, Book Two.
My name is Tom Hogeback. I've been seriously into photography since probably high school. First time I developed a picture, I was kind of smitten. Studied when I was in California, UC Berkeley certificate program. Moved to Ohio, back to Ohio back in 1989 and started a picture frame. I liked working with my hands and it was something that I could do and still enjoy my photography. Nature inspires everything. Just the beauty, the symmetry, the simplicity and the complexity. You know, you've got to be out there to get it. And that's the key, that's what I enjoy. This was a shot taken coming from Canyonlands, pulled off the freeway and trudged into the woods with my camera and tripod, the symmetry. And the lines really drew me in. It's not black and white, but it gives you that effect. And everybody likes a birch aspen tree. This is the Roosevelt elk. I looked for these guys for a week, didn't see them. On the way out, my friend looked up and said, look at that. So I got that shot. Just about three or four shots and he didn't want us around anymore. So I felt really happy about that. One of my favorite things about photography is it gets me away. I was in the habit of doing two trips a year, one in the spring and one in the fall to collect images. Life changes and uh, then COVID hit. So I'm doing a lot of florals now and local wildlife. This image was taken on the southern part of Houston Woods Loop. The red buds about this time of year now, around Easter, just magnificent. And this was shot with my Hasselblad. It's a film camera, 120 millimeters. So I'm able to get really nice images to make large prints. Now I understand this um, gala celebrates nature. I guess this would be the effects of nature. I got this in a drive-by moment, just cruising real slow and this popped out to me on the side of the road. This is an old, some people say it's a Chrysler, some people say it's a DeSoto that had been parked in this barn. And I guess over the years, age and nature have taken a hold on it. It wasn't quite this vibrant when I took it, so a lot of that is through Photoshop. I did go through a couple of different times in a program called Silver Effects to bring out some of the grays and the lines and then some curves to bring out the colors in the car. One of the tricks about photography is to see it and to visualize what it can be and to know how to do it and get it there. My name is Marcia Waller and I am a watercolor artist in uh, one of the third floor studios here at the Art Center. I started painting in the early 1990s, um, a little late in most artists' lives, but I'd always been interested in it, but just never really thought I could actually do it. I had the opportunity to take a night class in watercolor and of course it was just absolutely terrible the things we, we started painting flowers and I, <laughs> I, I thought I could draw a little but that wasn't going well at all but then when I had a little more instruction uh, and some guidance uh, it just made all the difference and so I still do the classes and uh, but it was I then discovered that this was something that I just love to do. When I was a child I used to love to climb trees I would go to my aunt's house and she had this 
huge old apple tree and I just loved spending time in that tree. I don't think she thought it was very ladylike but I was happy with it. <laughs> and as I've um, grown we've had the opportunity to go uh, hiking in many different places. I just love it when I'm out in nature and um, of course when I do that I bring my camera and take lots of pictures with the hope of finding something that uh, I'll then want to paint. I'll be walking along and I see maybe a tree and it's got um, some wonderful shadows on it. And the light is hitting it just right and maybe like the sycamores um, that we have along some of the trails here in Oxford. When the blue sky is shining and you see the white of the barkless trees and then the shadows that that makes. Something like this, I mean, I'm, I know I was walking behind these two folks and I saw that going off into the distance and the path narrowing down. I, I had to take a picture of that. That was just, just beautiful. I learned long ago that everybody has a style and it's kind of in you. Um, you might try to change it, you might be able to change it a little bit, but it, it's just there. And you know, we used to be able, in my watercolor class, we could tell who did that painting, who did that one, who did that one. No titles, no names, but it was just how it came out through them and landed on the paper. My name is Beth Dornan Hoxie. I grew up in Oxford. Um, I've been a photographer and artist probably all my life, but mostly photography since I married my husband, whose father was George Hoxie, who a lot of people here know. This one is called um, The Lady. It is Trillium. And because I've also studied herbs, I know that the Native Americans use this flower for uh, the midwife for it. This one was for my garden, and I don't have a name for it, but I just love the texture and the color of it, and I want to be it. That's how I am with these pieces. I want to be there in it, and, and that is, uh, I love the colors of that too. So I grew that cabbage. This is one that is inspired by a friend of mine who lives in Michigan. Uh, she uses a scanner to make her artwork. And these are some flowers that my husband gave me. And when they dried, I couldn't let them go. And I was able to lay them on the scanner and photograph that. And then this is older. It is a black and white film. So it's a silver print of a rhubarb leaf out in my yard up in Michigan when I was living there. So that was done in a dark room, which we don't really know what they are anymore. <laughs> and I like it because the sun was on the other side. This is underneath it with the sun on the other side and it gives us a uh, shimmer through it and it, it just has a lot of texture in it that I like. What inspires me about nature has more maybe to do with texture. I could do a whole show on tree bark. Anything that has to do with water excites me. Uh, water, the all of nature excites me, so it's hard to nail down any one thing. You know, the creator created all this, and I'm just trying to capture it.
Welcome back, friends. I hope you enjoyed that lovely concert by our friend Bruce Murray. And I hope you've had a wonderful evening here with us tonight. Uh, we have some people that we need to thank before we let you go. First of all, we have to thank our donors who gave us such great auction items and also all of our supporters who helped us with their sponsorship money and uh, time and effort. I want to thank Bonnie Mason, the chair of our gala committee and all our gala committee members, Kim Paterka, the president of our board of trustees and our board of trustee members. Of course, my lovely staff and all the volunteers who've helped make this year's virtual gala such a fun, exciting event. We have a couple of things to go over with you before we let you go. You can also run and see these facts on our website at oxarts.org or also on the Give Smart app that you're on currently. So as you know, the silent auction still goes until 10 p.m. So you still have an hour and a half to bid high, bid often, and get that favorite item you've been eyeing all night. At 10 o'clock, the auction will end. At that time, we'll also draw three raffle tickets for our mystery boxes, and those winners will be notified by either text or email. And then we want to make sure you understand that all bids are final. So you want to make sure before you hit that final button that it is exactly the item that your heart desires. All payments for tonight's auction will be need to be finalized by Monday. And then you can begin to pick up your items on Tuesday during our normal business hours from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. or on Wednesday or Thursday from 2 p.m to 6 p.m. If you need to make arrangements to pick up your item after our pickup days, you can call the office at 513-524-8506. If you'd like your item shipped to you, we can do that for an additional fee. Please note that if you don't make arrangements by May 1st or pick up your item during our open office hours, we will ship your item to you at your expense. I wanna say thank you everyone for letting us be a part of your evening tonight. I hope you've enjoyed today's gala and I hope you were able to bid on the item of your choice. This gala is so important to the Oxford Community Arts Center. Uh, over 70% of our uh, income and expenses is covered by this gala and the donations from you are wonderful sponsors. So please bid high, bid often. The auction will be open until 10 o'clock. I hope you've enjoyed this year's virtual gala. We hope to be in person next year for another wonderful gala. Thank you and have a great night.